this year has been uh, really busy, to be honest. I mean, I'm all the time at home. Uh, there are no concerts, obviously. A lot has changed. I have to kind of start to reinvent myself again. Like, I'm so used to play all the time shows and um, not being home. And now it's like you're constantly at home and you have to find a way how to make money with music. Um, so, yeah, I try to do a lot of session jobs, um, try to like do more online lessons. Um, then we did a new Septic Flash album. I did also a new solo album. Both of them are currently in the making. Um, and I also try to do a lot of uh, YouTube videos. So I try to stay busy, let's put it this way. But it's just different because I um, no, I cannot play anywhere and it doesn't look like there's going to be shows in the near future. So there are a few shows planned, but to be honest, I think it's too early to say, you know, we need, we need more vaccinations and um, there has been constantly lockdown after lockdown. Sometimes they would open up stores, um, but most of the time, like for, for musicians, nothing has changed since one year, since one year, everyone is sitting at home. That's the problem. Luckily from this Friday on, I will be able to make a term in to get uh, a term in for my vaccination. I always wanted to play drums since I can remember. I think that's the instrument that was something I needed to play. Um, so looking back at my childhood, I would just, you know, beat on stuff uh, around and everything that was could be used as some sort of a drum I would use and play on it you know I just got uh, the bongos from my dad and I would just make noise uh, and then when I got into my teenager years I had the chance to play on a real drum kit a little bit more often and um, so I spent half of my childhood uh, in the mountain area of Austria where good friends of mine are living and they had a drum kit so they gave me the possibility to play on a real drum kit and every free time we would go there, get out of the city, um, get some nature. It's a little bit calmer. And I would also like, I would play the whole day more or less. I would do nothing else. Uh, so I started to play drums in around 2002, three, something like this. And in 2004, I got my first drum kit. And from there on, I tried to find a practice room and I could find a room in my old school. Yeah, and I did nothing else than just play drums. You can, it's like in the holidays, I would go in the school again. Nobody wanted to be in the school, you know, <laughs> but I was like, I'm going there. I spent two months and playing all the time. Um, yeah, so this was for drums, as I said, has there was always this need that I always wanted to play it, but it was simply not possible for me until you know, friends had drums or until I could buy a drum kit and I found a practice room because I live in a flat or I live mostly in a flat. And so real drums are never an option, to be honest. Actually, none of them were the starting point because for both, I needed to be already, I, should, I would need some skills. Yeah. If I just start to like learn how to play drums by joining these bands or doing my solo project, uh, I wouldn't be good enough. So <laughs> I had other bands before it was, it was like school bands. It was like some rock bands, cover bands. Um, and then I think Thorns of Ivy was my first metal band, to be honest, or like extreme metal band. But I, um, yeah, I needed some skills to play in this band. Otherwise there would be no chance. <laughs> Yeah, like when I started to play drums, I had no teacher, so I tried to learn from my heroes back then. And it was a lot of from the music I was listening. And for sure, one of the big influences was Joey Jordison from Slipknot. Um, I know that uh, some people say like, ah, with this new metal shit and stuff. But for me, he was really impressive. And um, because it was, it was fast, it was groovy, uh, but I could understand it and it had this energy I was looking for. So I tried to watch every video I could find. I was playing along the CDs 
and yeah a lot like corn also a lot of these you know new metal 2002 three bands they seem to be the kind of drumming style i wanted to to learn and something i could reach um so these were my teachers yeah and these were my big inspiration and f as i said yeah joey jordan is for sure my main inspiration later on um, Daniel Erlandson from Arch Enemy, Nick Barker from Demo Borgir. This is when I get into the more extreme stuff. And I would do the same thing. I would try to find videos or just analyze what they're doing. Okay, here's the snare, here's the kick. Let's try to repeat that groove. If it was still too fast, I tried to make my own version. But yeah, it was, it was cool times. Uh, but it was really difficult to find any information because there was no YouTube back in the day uh, so you had to only watch live dvds or get some i don't know vhs actually there were not really a lot of dvds so the old school tapes books more magazines you know i don't know how to read notes so i just play everything by ear um but i had the sticks magazine it was called and some other i think it was drum and percussion so these are like some drummer magazines where you had a story, let's say about Joey Jordison, like two or three pages, and he would talk about his drum kit. And then there was a play along CD where you could play to the songs without the drums. And they would have all the notation written down, but I never cared really about this. I was just, okay, cool. There's a song without drums. Let's try to make my own version out of it. So yeah, magazines, books, VHS, some DVDs, and later than YouTube, right? To be honest, I started to play guitar almost at the same time when I started to play drums. But of course, I did not spend as much time like playing drums. You can tell because <laughs> I got much better in, in, drum, in drumming and uh, guitar has always been just a, a tool to write music. I was always interested in just being a musician, not only a drummer, you know, and I think it is important to also have an understanding of melody, being able to create a song structure and write material. Um, so yeah, I, I take the instrument, let's say if it's guitar, bass or piano, whatever, I just take it and I just try to experiment and I have a melody in my head and I try to kind of recreated in reality so i have no idea what i'm doing all the chords i play no idea it's just some chords i have seen like my dad showed me some then some other friends and a lot is like trying out and i have this philosophy that you can kind of play every instrument i mean not in a professional way but if you spend enough time with an instrument you will get something useful out of it yeah so Drums 2003, four. Okay, guitar maybe it was 2005, six, something like this. That's when I also started to do my first compositions, which I never really released, but it was just writing guitar riffs to a click track. And then I had something to also practice to with the drums, right? And then later on, after I left Decapitated, it became my solo project and I, I'm just making albums and songs myself. No, I, with not with no instruments at all. That, not with drums. Um, okay, with drums a little bit, but uh, it has always been so boring for me that I said like, "Fuck it, no." <laughs> <laughs> and um, for guitar, no, no idea. I mean, I know how to tune a guitar. I know how to change the strings. Uh, I know a couple of chords, um, but it's a lot again, just doing it. Um, not think too much about it and your ear will tell you anyways if it sounds wrong or not so yeah this is my theory yeah i have a, a new solo album coming up um it's at the moment we we start with the mixing i wrote everything more or less in a month like last september october uh, I wrote the material and then I started immediately record drums at my friend's place and then right after guitar we did vocals because there's going to be vocals on there um, in February this year 
And so everything has been like pretty quick, like one thing at a, after another. Um, and so the cool thing is I don't have any stress with this album or with my solo project because there is no label. I just um, and can release music whenever I feel like and whenever I have the time. Luckily, the lockdown and the whole Corona thing happened, luckily for the solo project, not for the rest of the world, because uh, I was at home and I had time to compose. And um, I mean, it's tricky. Sometimes you just don't feel like writing music. But uh, last year, yeah, around autumn, I just feel I felt like, OK, if I pick up the guitar now, I think there might be something interesting coming up. And so it was. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's going to be a new album coming out. I hope this year actually, it's, yeah, should be this year. But things are, you know, like in the production, we're doing the mix right now, uh, working on the artwork at the same time. Um, I try to make um, new t-shirt designs with my friend. And whenever it, everything is done, like the whole thing, then I will start to release it. But I have no release date yet or any idea when this can be. Yeah, I know it's a very common name in the Turkish community and uh, it's always very funny when I come to, to Turkey um, on the airport, they try to talk Turkish with me and I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't understand this, but your name is Kerem. I said, yeah, no, but um, they just cannot believe, let's put it this way, that there is an Austrian guy that has no Turkish family. That's how it is. And um, but I have a Turkish name and um, this is very unique, right? In other countries, I get problems with that <laughs> because, you know, uh, but uh, when I, whenever I come to Turkey, it is just uh, really funny for me. And yeah, so everyone is like uh, immediately starting to speak Turkish with me and they're like, no, 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 I don't understand it. I just have the name. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool. You know, why not? It's a, it's a, it's a nice name. Um, uh, it's definitely something unique for the Austrian standards. So with Behemoth, it was like um, I, I needed to help them out more or less. So the drummer got really sick and he needed uh, an emergency surgery. Um, so he was in very bad condition and had a couple of shows lined up. So they were just asking people if they can play in the um, Eventually, they called me and said, like, hey, you know what, our drummer is sick and uh, we have a show in 10 days. Could you maybe help us out? And I was like, aha, uh -huh, OK, so what show? Yeah, it's a big open air festival in Warsaw. Um, you should learn around 12 to 14 songs. But keep in mind, we, we play them different live. So I would suggest you if you go on YouTube and um, you will learn from this and this video because uh, this is the best you should do, right? And I said, like, okay, I was shaking at that moment because, you know, it's just a pretty big thing if such a big band is calling you and especially the material is not easy, right? Um, I said, like, okay, give me a couple of hours or a day. I will check it out and I will let you know. So I immediately went on YouTube. I downloaded the whole show. He suggested to learn. Um, yeah and then i was like fuck if i say no to this this will never ever come again this uh this chance so i knew even though i was really scared i knew that i have to say yes no matter what and so i called him and said okay i'm gonna do it and i hang up the phone and i went straight to the practice room immediately like not even one second afterwards and i did nothing else than just wake up in the morning listen to the song like i did song by song i wrote down the song structure by because I, I don't know how to read notes so i wrote like um simple structures like blast beat two times tom fill then uh fast double bass so i had it all written down i was going in the room play until i was destroyed come back home eat sleep half an hour and go back play again and um, actually I had less than 10 days because we had four days of rehearsal. So I had, yeah, just a week or so to learn everything. I was going to Warsaw, we started to rehearse. The first shows, 
Where with rough for me, it's just material that it's really extreme and I'm not used to. Um, but then it felt better. And I think the guys also were happy that they asked me and, you know, we got better and better life. And I actually played more than I thought because the plan was just six shows in the summer. But the Inferno, their drummer, he needed longer to recover. Uh, and then I was going with them to Asia. We did a one month in Asia and Australia. And even in like winter, autumn, winter, I had to play a Polish tour with them. So I think I played around 30 shows with them. Uh, but yeah, it was a really, it uh, was a great experience, you know, something I'm glad I said yes, even though I was scared. <laughs> I was really scared. And uh, But this, these are the moments when you just, you kind of know this is the chance you have to do it because very often you have to wait for such a moment. There are so many amazing musicians out there that never have the chance to get such an offer. And I would have been stupid to say no, right? So yeah, it was a wild time, but it was great. And I really enjoyed it. And forever grateful they asked me for that. There was not really an audition. I just, you know, I, the thing was I stopped with Behemoth and then maybe a couple of weeks later, I see the news that Joey Jordison is not in Slipknot anymore, which was for me absolutely shocking, first of all, because, you know, I really enjoyed the band and or I still enjoy the band. And uh, it was just impossible for me to imagine Slipknot without Joey. Um, but yeah, this happened and so I had no band. I just uh, stopped playing with the biggest Polish metal band. And for some weird reason, I was so hyped up that I was like, okay, if this worked with Behemoth, maybe this works with Slipknot. Who knows? So I, I talked with some friends of mine and they kind of agreed with me like, hey, why you don't, why you don't just throw on some YouTube cover videos? Who knows? Because YouTube has been the place that brought me into Decapitated. Um, it has been a place where I can show what I can do more or less. So I thought this was going to be the same idea, like I record one or two songs. And my friend had a studio termin and he said, I'm going to give you my termin um, or my studio date. Just learn a couple of songs. I'll get you some cameras and we're going to do two songs. And so we did, and uh, the internet went crazy afterwards. It just exploded. I was a bit shocked to see that in a positive way. I, I did not uh, expect that. So the media started to, to write about it and talk about it, and uh, it just the views got more and more. And for some small, like, how do I say, moment, I thought like there is a chance that I'm pretty sure they saw the video Slipknot, but it's such a huge band. It's like a own government almost. And I'm pretty sure whenever Joey left, they had someone else to fill in and there's management and whatnot. So I never got any contact with the band or with anyone from the band, even though it was so hyped up, um, which is okay. You know, I think it was still a win-win situation because the I think one of these videos now is around 3 million views. The other one is a two or it's even more. So a lot of people saw it, right? So that's for me a win and a lot of people enjoyed it. And if I would be in Slipknot, that would have been also a win, but I'm not, <laughs> but I'm in Septic Flash and that's also cool. And I'm really happy with how it turned out. It's everything is cool. And yeah, I just recently watched the videos again and I do enjoy it uh, watching it and I I'm proud of, of the performance and I'm also proud of the fact that I didn't hesitate and I just gave it a shot. You know, why not? Probably very often this is the way to do it, just to jump into the cold water and give it a shot. Mm, we wrote the album, or like I wrote the album together with Vogue. Um, we just jammed around. It was a very um, old school approach by just playing together in the practice room, trying to collect ideas, recording them. With Septic Flesh, it's the opposite. Everyone is working alone at home and then kind of bringing 
full song ideas to the table and send it to each other. But with Decapitated there, it was like, okay, we're going to have a drum beat and then we're going to jam around. And whenever there's a cool riff, okay, let's keep that. Let's record it quick. Um, and so the process felt very nice. Some ideas from this album have been or had been uh, written before with Vitex. So it was as if he or he was actually part also on this album, which are, I'm really grateful that this happened. Like, so some ideas were before my time. We continued with them. Other songs were completely new. Um, and it felt very spontaneous and easy, the songwriting process. Uh, and then it was time to record. And I was, we were driving to uh, Radio Ketansk, which is on the north of Poland. It's a big radio studio where you can probably fit a full orchestra inside. And we were starting to record uh, drums there around a week or so. It was winter um, and we got Daniel Bergstrand from Sweden, who was a crazy engineer. He came down and uh, he made some crazy mad scientist stuff with the drums. He, like we put the piano in front of it and we had to open the door because we wanted to use the staircase as a natural reverb so nobody could walk around in the house while I was recording and if someone was walking around we had to stop the recording it was wild uh, but I really loved it it was my first real big professional recording scenario um, I've done recordings before but nothing that I can say you know is released on Nuclear Blast or where it's such a big production is behind it. Um, yeah, and um, the, the album is going to be 10 years already this year. 10 years since the release of Carnival is Forever, uh, which is crazy. It just shows how quick the time is running. <laughs> the connection was, again, through... Um, yeah, kind of social media and the internet. Um, I don't know who was it. I think it was Nergal from Behemoth that, uh, so it was w one year after I left from, or I, I finished playing with Behemoth, he said like, you know, there's my friends from, from Septic Flesh are looking for a drummer. Maybe it's something for you. Let me put you in contact. And that uh, was around end of 2014, right? So I, I rode with Christos and I told him like, you know, it sounds very nice. Let me let me um, play through a couple of your songs and I will record you videos again. It's just so you can see how I play it. And um, I put two videos on my YouTube channel, like Prototype and Vampire from Nazareth. And these two videos were actually not audition videos because they, I think they knew that I can play it. But this is what I wanted to show them like. This is how I will play your songs. Do you like it? And they said, yeah, we really like it. And um, the whole thing started to happen in 2015. So beginning of 2015, I joined uh, Septic Flesh. And then we pretty immediately were going on our first tour together with Moonspell in Europe. And then, yeah, we did Codex Omega together, uh, which was, a uh, it was, it's always difficult to make an album with a new band, um, you, you don't know how is the chemistry. Like, as I said before, it's a very different approach and writing material. So we have four people like writing full songs and they also said to me like, oh, you play guitar, yes. So if you have riffs, bring them on the table. Maybe they're good, we're gonna use them. Just, uh, or you have a song structure idea, let's do it. Which was cool because they, also, on the other hand, if they had drum ideas and programmed drums, which were just really fitting the, the song, I tried to play it very similar because why to change it? So it's four people working at the same time on something can be a bit chaotic, but it's also very nice that everyone is so involved in that. With Active Denial, it, it's one of, like, a, it's a band I was working as a session drummer. So it I was uh, asked last year to uh, record with them. And I really enjoyed the material because it's like this old school melodic death metal, which everybody loves and likes. And when, when I found out 
who they have as well in the lineup. I was a bit shocked, like, wow, okay, this is a really big thing. So, um, yeah, they released a couple of singles from what I know. There's going to be definitely a full album because I recorded a full album. <laughs> but I don't know what's their plan when they're going to release it. Um, I think the best would be to check in the internet because the internet knows everything these days. Totally. Uh, totally, right? Um, yeah, I hope they will release it soon. I think to just wait also a little bit how is the situation with COVID and everything. Um, so yeah, it was a fun project. It's just really cool, melodic death metal stuff. Easy to listen, but um, the feedback has been great. You have soil work vocalist singing on there and uh yeah a lot of great musicians involved really cool yeah i've been working with harakiri for the second album already or the newest album and i'm pretty sure like whenever they have new material and i have time to do it that i, I will work with them again because they're they're an Austrian band. They don't live far away from me. I really enjoy the music. Um, they're cool guys. And uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was great. It's again a session job. I'm not part of the band. They have a, a live drummer. But I don't know how it actually happened that they have asked me. I think it was a connection through a friend of mine. And it was like, hey, you want to record drums for them? I was like, okay, I don't know them. Let me check it out. And uh, yeah, the feedback is great. I think the people enjoy it because some albums have drum computer before, from what I know, or programmed drums. And with real drums, it's just a different thing. And what I'm really happy about, their last album reached top, uh, I think it was number four in the German charts. So in the top 50 charts, they went number four with this album. And it's just crazy that a metal band is going that high by selling, you know, their CD in between pop artists and hip hop artists. So that's a big step, actually. But on the other hand, I'm not surprised because the music is good. And also the community of this, like black metal fans, they just, they're super supportive. They buy the albums, they buy the merchandise, they're old school in their thinking. It's not only Spotify and uh, streaming. So they are really supportive. and. Yeah, I want to work definitely again with Harakiri for this guy if they if they want to as well. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a session shop. I don't know when I did that. Uh, it's a long time ago, but uh, I don't even know if they still exist and what they're doing now. So this is something I'm probably not going to do again. It's just, uh, it was a session shop back in the days, but now I just want to focus on other stuff. Nothing is planned so far. Um, only metal stuff, only metal session jobs. But I don't want to say no, because um, I want to always expand my musical horizon. Um, and a, a good example is George Collias, which was just recently in an interview with you guys, as I saw. He's really a big inspiration because I heard and saw that he does a lot of like fusion funk stuff right now. And he records a lot of this stuff right now. Um, so I definitely don't want to say no. I have done or like I have played with bands in the past that were rock or alternative version blues stuff that was before i became a professional musician um but i enjoyed it right it's much easier you don't have to go super fast and it's not complicated and it's all about the feeling so who knows you know also getting older maybe it will be time to do something else as well not only play crazy fast stuff yeah but Right now, nothing is planned. So the session shops that are coming up is just metal. <laughs> with metal, I have heard everything. It's the same with George. I think he has done everything in extreme drumming. There is nothing more that he can really explore. So that's why he goes different directions. He doesn't know all of this new stuff. And there's so much to explore. 
and uh, hey as long as you have the passion for learning something new and you can implement this in your playing i totally respect it and i think it's amazing Wow, there's a lot of drummers that are amazing and inspiring. Um, so let me just name a few which are have been an influence or are still an influence. I mean, let's let's start with Joey Jordison. I'm a huge fan of Mario Dublantier from Gojira, which I think everybody knows, and I think a lot of people really enjoy his playing. As he's, I always describe his playing almost like. He's a he's painting as well, right? So he's an artist, and the way he he plays drums is almost like painting a picture. The ideas he has, they have such a nice flow, and it's just this raw power and pure art. Um, then I have to, of course, say um, Gavin Harrison was also a big influence from Porcupine Tree. Um, Daniel Ellanson from Arch Enemy, Nick Barker. Steph from Textures, he has been also a big influence. It's really difficult to say uh, because, you know, almost every drummer, I will say it like this, every drummer can be an inspiration, even unknown drummers. I remember being on tour and just watching support bands. Um, and it, there were so many amazing drummers out there, which you couldn't believe, like nobody knows them, but uh, it was just fun to see them mastered an instrument and having a good time and uh it was really inspiring to watch them yeah oh let's put Eloy Casagrande also inside because he's a machine how could I forget him yeah definitely sports helps you maintain like a healthy body I wouldn't say that it makes you play better drums but um i like to do body weight exercises uh just to have more muscle mass i like to do a lot of yoga and stretching just to be flexible to not tense up i also do a lot of uh like running and biking so stamina work um it is a different form of stamina like compared to playing drums because playing drums you don't go so high with your heart rate it feels more like a, a boxing fight, you know, it's just up and down, up and down in, in the intensity. And also mentally, it's so exhausting. I think the brain eats up so much of your capacity, so much of your energy, because there's a lot of coordination going on. And with sports, like running wise, it's something that once you're in the rhythm, you can kind of run forever. It's just very monotone, like uh, going straight forward, right? But for sure, it, it helps me to, you know, have um, more muscle mass on my arms and on my legs and just uh, prevent injuries. And so, as I said, yeah, I do a lot of body weight exercises, not lifting weights, so just my body weight, um, a lot of coordination exercises, balance exercises everywhere where I need to kind of use all the small muscles as well, because drumming is exactly this. It's just uh, the connection of all the small nerves and muscles with your brain. And it's really difficult to like understand your body and being able to control everything. So you can play that fast, that long, that loud or that extreme, you know. I mean, there are drummers out there that just play drums and don't do any sports and they're killing it. Um, for me, I decided to just have an overall healthy lifestyle and um, I also have to say that I have been in a sports school for like eight years. So I'm so used to doing sports, all kinds of sports. And this is my second big passion next to music. That's something that I've always enjoyed and I will always enjoy doing. At one point, I think I even wanted to become a sports teacher. You know, if music wouldn't turn out to be my job, that probably would have done something with uh, sports. So. I like to combine it and especially metal drumming. I love the, the physical and mental challenge of it. It's like everything on a super high level, you know. Yeah, so I finished all the school I need to do. Um, so high school, sports high school. Then we had uh, something called civil service or army in Austria. 
So every man has to serve the country in a way. If you're healthy, that it's with the army, it's like six months. And if you decide to not go to army, you have the option to do civil service, which is either you help elderly people or you work in the ambulance. Um, so I did this because I didn't want to cut my hair because if you go to army, you have to cut your hair and I said, no, <laughs> plus, um, I think, okay, it was longer, but I just wanted to do that. I just didn't feel like the army is representing what I have in mind, not only the hair. <laughs> so, um, I have done that. And then was the big question to like, what to do now. Right. Um, I was planning to study drums, like for real, go to a music school and finish it. Uh, but in the same time, I put out the YouTube videos and um, I kind of made the shortcut. So I got offers from bands and this was exactly where I wanted to be anyways. Um, so I, either with the, like a finished drum studies, but I, it turns out that you don't really need that to become a professional musician. So yeah, it was pretty quick, like after I did all my duties, like school and the civil service, um, YouTube offered me or gave me offers. So this way, it gave me offers to play with bands. And then I turned 21 and I joined Decapitated. And from then on, I am a professional musician. I do nothing else than this. I'm a self-employed uh, mini company here in Austria. So I'm officially an artist, um, and I pay my tax and everything and insurance. Um, yeah, but uh, that, that's actually my real first job because it was kind of right after, not right after school, but I did the civil service and then I gave myself one or two years to just figure out stuff. And then, yeah, the, the whole thing happened with Decapitated. I'm not the fastest drummer out there, for sure not. I see myself as a, a hmm, how do I say that? Like a, a drummer that sits right in between of groovy stuff, fast stuff, technical stuff. So a little bit from everything. Um, so I'm definitely not specialized in one field. So my blast beats are not going extremely fast. Uh, therefore, I, I use mostly wrist motion for all the drummers out there. So I would highly recommend work on your wrists because they have a lot of stamina power in there. And um, it's just a, a very basic um, technique that you should definitely learn. Other drummers that go even faster use a lot of their fingers. It's called flying finger technique. I rarely do that. So for hands it's actually wrist or full arm motion for my legs. Well, yeah, I think I'm known for the swivel technique, which is something that developed on its own, more or less. Um, so, and then later on, I realized that George Golias, again, that the master himself um, was doing that already years before. And somebody told me that, like, hey, you're doing the swivel technique. And I'm like, which technique? The, the swivel technique. So I did some research and I, I found out that someone else had the same idea. I never really learned it in particular. It just developed on its own. And um, so the same here, there are drummers that go much faster than me, but I, I like to always focus on um, playing with groove and identity and uh, with some sort of attitude um, rather than go extremely fast. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's most important to play like with an attitude so that whenever you play and somebody listens to you they know like oh this is Krim I know he's playing the same with Mario from Gojira like he plays two grooves and without looking I know it's Mario I think it's the same with Eloy Casagrande he plays something it doesn't have to be fast I know it's Eloy the way he plays it it's just his identity Yeah, it's a very difficult word to say, Charce Kopito, because I'm also not Polish, so my spelling is also horrendous for this word. Probably all the Polish people are like, ah, no, don't say it this way. We can also call them CK pedals, then it's much easier. So yeah, I use the foot blaster, exactly. Um, that's a new way of triggering it. Usually the, the triggers were sitting on the bass drum itself, and it was touching the drum head. 
but that's something that it's very um, risky in terms of if you hit other drums too heavy then sometimes you have missed triggers because um, the vibration goes into the bass drum and then you have a missed trigger and with the foot blaster it kind of sits on the pedal uh, and uh, so the pedal has to physically touch the sensor and you can play against the couch against the wall against whatever you want all that has to happen is the footboard has to hit or the pedal has to hit the trigger sensor so it's pretty cool and um, a lot of my my buddies and colleagues have changed to the foot blaster because it just gives you so many possibilities now and it's not so sensitive in terms of how you tune your bass drum and stuff and yeah the pedals the ck pedals or chachi kopita pedals yeah these pedals um, i really enjoy and love uh, i've i've been in this company for or i'm playing with this company for more than 10 years now this is i i got one of the prototypes to try out when the company just started out um probably because i just started to play with decapitated and i was in poland and he gave to all the polish drummers he gave the prototype to try out i needed it a little bit to to adjust to them but now i see only the benefits from it and um, it's such a great company that have supported me um very good and uh you know we this is a friendship not only um an endorsement thing and the quality of the pedal like for real and you can ask other artists that play this pedal there's no other pedal out there that is so robust and uh built like military equipment you know so it's it's crazy that <laughs> for it's an expensive pedal yes but all the high-end materials or like high-end pedals that are on the market are in the same price range but this one is just he puts even more uh, material on there just to prevent damage on tour and so this thing survives everything and this is what i really love about it let's go through the whole drums then uh i play minor symbols also for quite a while already minor symbols approached me in also 2010 right when i started with decapitated they were the company that um were interested in supporting me and so they sent me a couple of symbols over and it's just really cool because again it became like this family feeling very super supportive and nice and have invited me to come to germany to the factory and it's just a really convenient thing as they are speaking german and it is six hours by car from my place okay it is a distance but it's not in the us or something like this right so i feel really welcome in in their community and um, i really enjoy their symbols so it is a mix of um if you want to know exactly a mix of bison symbols um i try a lot of the pure alloy custom crashes um i have some symbols which are discontinued my my right symbol is a symbol that i got as the first symbol from them so it's more than 11 years now old and it still lasts uh and uh it's not damaged and i really enjoy the sound so i will keep playing until it breaks um yeah so i i change few symbols here and there but most of the time i kind of play the same set the same sizes and the same um series of symbols and if you continue with drums i use tama drums um i have a star classic maple drum kit in the sizes 10 12 14 16 so these are the toms four toms which are set up in a symmetrical way so if you look at the youtube videos and you watch from the top it kind of if you split the drum kit in the middle you have almost identical parts on the right uh, or the same amount of parts on the right side and on the left side then i have two kick drums they are 22 by 18 snares i mainly have steel snares now i have um, a vintage snare drum which I bought used from somewhere. It's also a Thomas snare. It's from the year 1980. So it's older than me, much older than me. But I do enjoy this vintage snare sound. Um, yeah, what else we have? Remo drum heads. So I play Remo drum heads for a couple of years already. It's just the best drum heads you can have. It's the, you know, it's very classic sound. But um, when you start to play drums and you go in a music store, 
it's 99% for sure that you're gonna have uh, an ambassador snare head on your snare drum. So it's good to, to be with all these companies, yeah. And I have Pro Mark sticks. Yeah, so the pedals, as I said, there's, there's the Charger Capito pedals, which I really enjoy. And sticks, I used um, the Pro Mark sticks. I don't know yet um, what I will choose in like the stick size, because apparently the one I'm using right now is going to be discontinued. So I will have to search for a new one, a new series. So I'm experimenting a little bit. But at the moment, if you want to know, or for those that want to know, I used the 419 drumstick, which is going to be difficult to find because, as I said, it's going to be discontinued. And then, but something around the 2B. So it's a really thick drumstick and uh, also a long one. There were a few venues which were. <laughs> It's really difficult to say. I some venues are very, very small. Like I remember once we went to the states and we were close to the Mexican border, and we actually had to move the venue because we came to the venue and we realized the stage was in a corner. It was like a club stage, you know, like for like a bar almost. And we there was the package of Moonspell, and Septic Flesh and Death Star, so it. You could not even fit one drum kit on the stage. It was that small. And also the other problem was it had steps in the stage. So there was not even one square meter of flat surface because there was all the time steps inside. So we decided to like, we told the promoter, if you want the show to happen, you have to find us a different venue. And they found one. We were of course late, but we did it. Uh, yeah, other stories, like for sure the one legendary moment was in Colombia when we played and uh, we played with Flash God on the South American tour. The Flash God plays before us and we're about to change and they play their last song. Uh, and I hear the drums are getting slower and slower and he plays less and less and it's pretty extreme music. So I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Something is wrong. Did something fell down or so? So I go to the stage and I look and he just looks super pale and he's about to fall over. And I'm like, what happens? Maybe it's so high or what's, what's going on? So I go on stage, the whole band turns around because obviously if you play no blast beat in Flash Cut Apocalypse, something is wrong. And he looked miserable, right? Um, everybody said, stop it, stop it. But he wouldn't stop. He kept playing. And then he just puked everywhere on the full drums. Um, there's a cool video about this. <laughs> So I'm behind him trying to help him in a way because I thought he's going to collapse because uh, Bogota is really high up the altitude. So it's really difficult to play that extreme stuff. And I thought he's, he, you know, he's going to faint. Um, yeah. So he puked everywhere. Um, we stopped, of course, the show. Uh, they brought him backstage. He was fine afterwards. Probably he ate something bad. But the show must go on. So it was like, OK, you have 20 minutes changeover. And so I just changed my pedals on the same carpet, on the same everything. And uh, I just played the show. It was, um, how to say, a pretty smelly experience. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy he was fine. You know, it was nothing serious. But these are some stories which are, you know, I will not forget for sure. I became a YouTuber without knowing that uh, I will be a YouTuber. I remember when um, I started to play drums, um, I would watch a lot of drum videos and then all of a sudden YouTube popped up. So this new platform and I was starting to record myself for practice reasons. So I would put a camera there, record myself and then watch it afterwards to see what I do wrong or does it sound right or not? Because when you're a beginner, you're so focused on playing drums that sometimes you don't even understand that you do something wrong. So as I always did, I was playing along songs. I did cover songs um, to learn how to play drums. And then YouTube came and I was like, you know what? If, if other drummers can put their stuff on there, let's put the video on there. Why not? So we talk about 2007. YouTube was really small. 
So I could put out um, really shitty videos, to be honest, nowadays, because the standard back then was was not important. One camera, um, shitty sound, just one full take, almost no editing. Nowadays, I mean, then later on, um, more and more people commented and uh, wanted more videos. So the whole thing started, right? Um, and also YouTube is the reason why I got the offer from Decapitated because they saw me playing a decapitated song. Um, and that's why they got in contact with me. And then I understood the power of social media and of YouTube, right? Uh, and then I kind of just put out videos whenever I had the time to do so. I never really wanted to pursue the career as a YouTuber because YouTube back then or the job as a YouTuber is not that old, right? So I'm like, more than 10 years on YouTube. And uh, for me, it has always been a place just to put out videos to show people, you know, how to play and to enjoy the videos. And then the copyright issue started. So YouTube started to delete videos or I got problems with copyright. So I said, like, I'm not going to do any covers anymore. It's not worth the work. Um, and just recently, while YouTube become or became a place where you can make a little bit of a living. I mean, I'm I'm not uh, living from YouTube. It's not possible for me. It's like I want to be a musician that plays concerts. And this is my main income. YouTube is just peanuts compared. But I like to do it because um, I always enjoyed making drum videos. That's the truth. So I like when it continuously grows, but I'm not after like behind some crazy, uh, I need subscribers like every month, 2000 more subscribers. I just let things happen on its own. Funny stories, no funny stories actually. There's only a sad story because I did not get any of this, play, uh, how is it called, the play button? Yeah, all right. you get it at 100,000, you get the silver one. And then yes. I think at 500,000 or a million, you get the, the gold one. No, I have 125,000 subscribers and they never send me anything. So that's not a fun story, but it's a sad story. So I'm waiting. YouTube, please send me this. I don't know. I just want to put it on the wall. Yeah. To be honest, the Turkish metal scene outside of Turkey, how to say, it's not, not something that I know personally that good. I remember playing in Istanbul and, uh, we play with a couple of Turkish bands there and it was cool. You know, I think your scene could be much bigger and like, how to say, it would be nice if m m there would be something more happening. Um, and just recently, like, uh, last month I did a session job with, uh, a solo project from a Turkish artist. It's like a thrash metal part, a uh, thrash metal project called, uh, Nightborn. And, um, yeah, so it was again, like a connection with Turkish metal. And he said the same was like, yeah, our scene is very small. Sadly, I would wish more will happen. Um, yeah. So I have to be honest and say that I don't know actually any Turkish metal bands. To be honest, I think I have been three times already in Istanbul. First, uh -huh, first with Decapitated on this festival, then with Septic Flesh on this festival, on the same festival, uh, together with Moonspell, because it was outside, that must have been 2000, Paul, what was this, 16? 15. 15? 15. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> and then number three, the, the last show, which was definitely the best show, and it, it kind of showed finally like the potential of the country. The first two shows, it's a huge festival, but not a lot of people. Um, but this last show we did was, I don't remember the venue, but it was a fantastic brand new venue. It was sold out. The crowd got insane. It was amazing. It was one of the best shows for sure. And uh, I'm not just saying this because we have an interview with a Turkish magazine, but it's the truth. You know, it was just uh, Everyone in the band said, like, wow, what an amazing show. The crowd was really into it. I think we had, if I'm not wrong, around 700 people, seven, 800 people. 
and I was surprised because uh, I remember that the other two shows and it was much smaller, right? I mean, the, the fans were into it, but it was not this amount of people. Uh, it was really nice. As I said, the, the venue was top, promoter was top. We could walk around a little bit in Istanbul. We got some, we went to some uh, like small traditional Turkish food places, which was really nice. I don't remember what was the place called, so don't ask me. <laughs> it was somewhere in the center. Um, but it was really nice. It's just crazy that you have traffic jams in the middle of the night. I remember this. It's like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. and then you have traffic going to the airport. And it's like, why? Why? There's so many people. It's like, why? Are... Everyone has to drive with the car. Um, yeah, but I would wish to spend more time there, you know. Usually when we play a show, it's like you arrive. You go to the hotel, you rest a bit, and then starts like preparation for the show. Um, sound check, and uh, you know, then you get some dinner, you play, and then you get out of the country immediately because it's not holidays, it's work, right? I have only good memories from Turkish people and from Istanbul, for real. So it was really, really cool. And I hope we will come there again soon, you know, whenever it's possible to play again with a new album, because the last show was superb. I mean, definitely we want to come back with Septic Flash because the last show showed us the potential and the feedback. Um, so we would be stupid to not come back, right? We just want to bring out a new album and then we see what the touring plan is going to look like. But, you know, Greece and Turkey, it's super close to each other. They fly an hour over. For me, it's a bit longer, but it doesn't matter. So it's kind of right around the corner. I want to say thank you very much for, first of all, listening to the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was uh, funny and informative. And also um, support your own scene because, you know, be proud of your scene. Uh, I would wish that more is coming out from Turkey and um, yeah, just be kind to each other, you know, it's a, it's a rough world and it's cool that the music and metal music can connect us, even if we have different languages and uh, different cultures. So, or like me having a Turkish name by actually being an Austrian, but doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just a... Uh, yeah, and um, I hope that we will come back to Turkey very soon and that the next show is going to be even crazier. So, and I, I'm also missing the, the Turkish food because it was delicious. <laughs>